presentation. I want to welcome you to tonight's special event. Uh, for those of you who don't know Bank Street well, um, we're in the process of an exciting period in our history. Um, we're thinking a lot about how do we build relationships beyond the walls of Bank Street and build connections with institutions and leaders and educators and artists and, as you'll see tonight, authors um, to strengthen our practice here. Uh, one of the big changes that happened in the arena of children's literature here at Bank Street this year is that we decided, after much deliberation, to keep the Bank Street bookstore open. And if you haven't visited yet, it's in a new home for five blocks south at 107th Street. And it's beautiful. And if you haven't seen it, please stop by there when you have a chance. Uh, this evening, we're truly fortunate to host Kwame Alexander, the 2015 Newbery winner for his novel and verse, The Crossover, and his father, Dr. E. Curtis Alexander, who graduated from Bank Street College in 1970. And they'll be in a <laughs> with the historian and scholar Leonard S. Marcus. This afternoon... This afternoon, Kwame Alexander began his tenure as the inaugural Dorothy Carter Writer-in-Residence, a program that will last for six weeks, working with the nine and ten-year-olds in the Bank Street School for Children on their poetry. Bank Street College is establishing an endowment to continue this Writer-in-Residency in the name of Dorothy Carter, a children's book author, a Broadway actress, the first African-American member of the Bank Street graduate faculty, and a leader of the Bank Street Writers Lab. We lost Dr. Carter in 2012, but her legacy will live on through this Writer-in-Residence program. It's fortuitous that Kwame Alexander will inaugurate this program, not only because he's the winner of the 2015 Newbery Award, but also because his father, who graduated in 1970, was a student of Dr. Carter's. In order to endow a named gift, Bank Street's trustees have determined that we must raise $50,000. And we're very grateful to Arlene and Ruben Mark, who are here this evening, for launching this effort with a generous gift. That gets us halfway to that goal. So if you'd like to support our efforts to endow the Writer-in-Residency in honor of Dorothy, you'll find additional information on the back of your program. And now I'd like to introduce Jenny Brown, who's the wonderful director of our Center for Children's Literature, and she'll introduce tonight's guest. Welcome, everyone. We are delighted to have you all here with us to kick off the inaugural Dorothy Carter Writer-in-Residence. Before I introduce our special guests, I'd like to acknowledge another special guest in the audience, Carol Carter, daughter of Dorothy Carter. <laughs> Carol is carrying on her mother's legacy at the Morningside Players, where Dorothy Carter served as artistic director. And she wanted me to let you all know that you're invited to attend their performances of Fences in May. So please do attend Fences. We're so happy you could be here with us, Carol. Really. I can't tell you. For real. We are too. The capital. <laughs> H. <laughs> and now to our program this evening. Almost a year ago, Allie Bruce, the children's librarian here at Bank Street College, was asked by Luann Toth, who's here with us tonight, to lead a panel at the School Library Journal Day of Dialogue. Kwame Alexander was on that panel, and I got to be in the audience. Kwame spoke of his passion for poetry and his commitment to exposing young people to cultures and experiences beyond their own. He said, and I quote, we all love, smile, cry. If we can get past the labels, we can become more diverse people, as opposed to trying to find diverse books, end quote. After hearing Kwame speak that day, Allie and I knew we had our writer in residence. 
But wait, there's more. When we invited Kwame Alexander to be Bank Street's first writer-in-residence at the School for Children, he said, why now? Tell me more about this writer-in-residency. So we told him about Dorothy Carter, the legacy she left as an author of children's books, a performer on Broadway, a leader in the Bank Street community as the first African-American graduate faculty member, the first Lucy Sprague Mitchell Award winner, and a leader of the Bank Street Writers Lab. He said, I don't know who's more excited, my father or me. <laughs> my father studied with Dorothy Carter at Bank Street. We can't help thinking that the spirit of Dorothy Carter was working to bring us all to this moment. And we are deeply grateful for the inspiration she has given us. Kwame Alexander, who is closest to me here, has previously published 18 books, including He Said, She Said, as well as Acoustic Rooster and his Barnyard Band, and Indigo Bloom and the Garden City, both NAACP Image Award nominees. He's also a published playwright and poet. The 2015 Newbery Medal for the Most Distinguished Contribution to Children's Literature went to Kwame Alexander for the crossover. <laughs> by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, and I believe his editor, Margaret Ramo, is here with us tonight. Margaret, can you? Twelve-year-old narrator Josh Bell uses the rhythms of a poetry jam to emulate the moving and grooving, popping and rocking of life on the basketball court with his twin brother, J.B. His powerful novel and verse paints an authentic portrait of a closely knit family. And we can imagine where that closely knit family comes from as we look at the two here. And I wish you all could have seen Kwame with those nine and 10 year olds today. He had them laughing and rhyming and rocking out. It was great. Dr. E. Curtis Alexander is a writer, publisher, and founder of the Bells Mill Historical Research and Restoration Society and a recipient of the 2009 Congressional Black Caucus Veterans Brain Trust Award for his research on Afro-Union soldiers and sailors. He has worked as a college professor, a freelance ethno-journalist for the New Journal and Guide, and a Garveyite ethno-historian, and is an ordained Baptist minister. Dr. Alexander currently serves as a senior pedagogical specialist at the Carter G. Woodson Education Center in Chesapeake, Virginia, founded by his wife, Barbara E. Alexander. It is the only African-centered educational institution in the state of Virginia, offering instruction for African children and their parents. Dr. E. Curtis Alexander's thesis in fulfillment of his Bank Street graduate degree was titled, <clears throat> The Development of a Course Curriculum in African and African American Art for Teachers, Nursery through Grade Six. The course was taught at Bank Street College for eight years. And Leonard Marcus in the middle <laughs> is our moderator this evening. He's one of the most respected historians and scholars of children's books in America. His books lead us through the lives of individual contributors, as with his biography, Margaret Wise Brown, Awakened by the Moon, and also the complex history of making books for children and getting them into children's hands, as in Dear Genius, The Letters of Ursula Nordstrom, as well as Minders of Make Believe. The exhibit Leonard curated for the New York Public Library, the ABC of it, Why Children's Books Matter, gave visitors an opportunity to literally walk through the history of children's literature in America and the way it was shaped by educational philosophy around the world. Bank Street College was honored to host three panel discussions on the exhibit. And last November, we hosted Leonard's lecture on Margaret Wise Brown and her life-changing student-mentor relationship with Bank Street founder Lucy Sprague Mitchell. Leonard S. Marcus received an honorary degree from Bank Street College in 2007. Please help me welcome our guests. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, um, to be with my two fellow uh, guests here. Um, I want to start, uh, Kwame, by asking you what it was like growing up with your father, and in particular, uh, what part did books play in your early life? What a pleasure to be here. Thank you for those kind words, Jenny. Thank you to Bank Street. Um, before I came, we were at, at, at uh, my parents' home in Chesapeake, Virginia, my mother said, do not say anything bad. <laughs> you can 
only talk about the good things that happened. And of course, in hindsight, all of it was good because it all created who I am. It all, um, but what was it like growing up in a home where, you know, someone asked me recently, you know, who were your favorite, who were your favorite librarians? <laughs> who were the librarians who impacted your life, you know? And you want to be able to name people, especially when you're talking to a librarian. <laughs> but my first two librarians were my parents. And so that was sort of my frame of reference for entering this world of books. Books were everywhere in my home. I mean, it was four walls of books. Uh, I remembered recently that there was a, we had a garage in Chesapeake, Virginia, and I liked to clean out the garage. And it was a junky garage. Um, and I tried to remember, why did I like cleaning out that garage so much? Well, it was because the garage had milk crates. Remember, you remember the milk crates? Right, so the garage had milk crates, green, black, red, all kinds of milk crates that were on the right wall. And the garage was about 14, 12 to 14 feet. And there were about maybe 20 rows and they were stacked to the ceiling and every crate had books in it. And I liked cleaning out the garage because I liked going and looking at the different books. I liked looking at the inscriptions. Each of the inscriptions said property of the Big Al, which was his nickname, or Dr. E. Curtis Alexander, and it ranged. It ranged from books, uh, first editions of poetry, um, to books on, on prehistoric, pre-colonial black Africa, to books on methodology, to books on, uh, we have children here, so I can't talk about it, but you can imagine what a 10-year-old boy going through puberty would like to see. <laughs> All kinds of books. And so what was it like? It was, it, was like, it was like my own sort of magical world that was created for me and it allowed me to sort of enter it whenever I wanted. And I didn't let my parents know how excited I was because, you know, you, you rebel. You know, you don't want to be forced to have to read. Um, as, as a 10 or 11 year old boy, you want to play outside. But when I found sort of those magical moments discovering these different books and the inscriptions and, and looking through them and reading the jacket copy. And that was really exciting for me. Yeah. Um, Dr. Alexander, am I right that Kwame was born around the same time that you were here at Bank Street? Well, Kwame was born in 1968. We came to Bank Street in 1969. <coughs> and my colleague, friend, Minnie Stein at the time, and if you live in New York, and if you're from New York or heard about New York, when you have a classmate by the name of Minnie Stein, you would expect to see not Minnie Stein from Texas, <laughs> who's sitting over here. She can tell you about her experiences. Her name now is Minnie Stein. Barito. Now, if you can figure out the barito, I can because I knew Joseph, and uh, we are going back a long time. The experience is two and a half blocks from here, St. Luke's Hospital, August 21st, 1968, Kwame was born about 8.15 at night. I was working down for, on 123rd for Morningside Heights Incorporated. That was an organization that came out of, of Stone Gym at Riverside Church. I ran from 123rd to St. Luke's. My friends were talking about, man, you got to have some cigars. Let's get my cigars. I have to go see my son. That happened a year before I had the good fortune of coming to Bank Street, which was down on Bank Street, 69 Bank Street in the village. Uh, we had a good time. Uh, Minnie and Sheila, Betty Machuca, we later put together three course offerings 
the introducer introduce my thesis in terms of African, African American art. She said it was taught here for eight years. I didn't realize that. But those four people were integral in developing courses for the first time here at Bank Street that lasted longer than a seminar or a seasonal workshop. So we feel very good about that. And inspiration for all of what we were taught that we could do, even though we did more than was expected of us, came from a person who is not just a name of a writer in residence, but a person who was a very warm person, a very direct person, a very supportive person, and to see Carol and Carol talk about, uh, do I know who she is? Now, young people, she didn't say that because like her mother, she was very clear about the English language and she could articulate and dramatize it at the same time. <laughs> And you just knew you were involved with someone special. So to come here tonight and see Carol it tells you something how, as to how old I am. To see Carol looking like uh, young Mrs. Carter, <laughs> and who gave Kwame a children's book because she knew I was interested in children's literature and had a son. So she would tell Ann Smith, one of the advisors, Joyce Washington, another advisor, and Constance Carr, another advisor, said, look at Al, he's trying to act like a teacher. I don't know what this child is going to go through, and he's only a year old. She said, let me give you a book. So she not happened to, she gave him a book. And I have, with a degree of humility, I've become an expert in African heritage children's literature, not only here in the Big Apple, but in London, in Denmark, in South Africa, simply because of, of the nurturing environment that we got here. Not only were we taught to learn how to nurture the children under our tutelage as student teachers here at Bank Street, but we were nurtured by Mrs. Carter and we were grown people. <laughs> so she was, you can't say enough about her so I'll stop at this point we we'll go to the next question. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what it was like growing up in his house. <laughs> I mean, you get, you get, you go to lectures and you hear him lecture and you see how he captivates the audience and, and you get lectures at home and you ask a question and, and, and what does this word mean? He says, look it up. Everything becomes sort of a literary um, experience. And after a while, whether you like it or not, it becomes a part of you. And at some point, you sort of figure out, how am I going to find my joy? I see what his joy is. Where is my joy going to come in? And, and eventually it did. Yeah. No, so, no, 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 no. <laughs> many, many can tell you, people, we, we were supposed to be in a, a, an environment of, 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 of creators, of innovators, of, of, of people who were going to make a difference. And she had to tame a segment of the hit students. I'm not going to call any names. Many was always refined. Many was always calm, and and, and she taught. She 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 thought about things before she said them. And many of us said things before we thought about them. <laughs> and we learned to immerse the child or children in an environment to create an environment where they would want to learn. So it wasn't about Kwame's exaggerating life. <laughs> he, he, had to learn. he didn't have to learn 
Now, here's something that those of you who think you are very smart about the Bank Street way, mm. if you listen to the administrators, they don't know what in the world they're talking about, but it sounds good. We didn't know what in the world we were talking about, but we took it for face value. So I'll say four words to describe the Bank Street method, or the Bank Street way. You know, the small school that started from 69 Bank Street. And many of I, many and I were wondering, what in the world have we gotten ourselves into? Oh, what, four-story building, a three-story building down on a little street that was about two blocks long? And the people we encountered made a difference in terms of how we viewed the world. I began in daycare. Now, people who worked for the Department of Social Services, everybody thought that was welfare, but they had a division called daycare. And I was fortunate to be one of the five males in a pool of 200 females. You can imagine what that was like going to meetings so we had to give intake reports. Five females, I mean, no, five males. I was the tallest, 6'4". My hair was black, so that has changed since 1967. And I had a daycare director. She had a problem. I said, why don't we have any books for children who look like the population that we're teaching? She said, if you know of some books, go out and find them. Okay. This is Mary Walton Daycare Center, 150 something, 58th, uh, and McCombs Dam, Holland River Houses. Then over Mary McLeod Bethune Daycare Center, Roosevelt Houses in Brooklyn. Now, named after two black women and no books for children that looked like the women they were named after. So Carter was immersed in that. He wasn't forced. I didn't tell him. I just told him to clean up the garage. I didn't, I didn't tell him to be so curious. But as Dr. Carter taught us, immerse the child, not only give nourishment, but uh, this is give something. direction. Here's the beauty, and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop. The beauty of it is, is that, I, in looking back on it, I believe you can create a curious child okay so yeah he, he did tell me just go clean up the garage but he also had created this curiosity and my mother had created this curiosity that made me want to sit down and republish his weekly in my bedroom like you know I don't think I had a choice I mean I had a choice but I think that curiosity was created by being immersed, that's what you're saying, being immersed in books. Yeah. And your curiosity seems to have gone in many directions, one of which was medicine, wasn't it? I read that you wanted to be a doctor when you were growing up. Well, yeah, I mean, because when you grow up in sort of a Walmart of books, you want to get as far away from language and literature as possible. And so I went to college wanting to become a doctor. I was like, I'm not doing any more writing. I'm done. Um, and, and so, and so two things, two things happened. Well, three things happened. One, I took a course called organic chemistry. <laughs> and, 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 and then I met a woman, and this was sort of how I came to sort of find my way back to poetry because I was introduced to poetry at a very early age. Um, in particular, uh, Spin a Soft Black Song by Nikki Giovanni. My mom read that book to me and my sister, and we got to choose the name of my youngest sister from that book. Wow. And, and the, the, the poem was, Come Nataki, Dance With Me. And so my sister Nataki is right here. <laughs> so that's sort of where, that was the beginning of poetry, but I found my way back to poetry through a woman, sophomore year in college, and wanted to impress her. And so of course, my way of doing that is by sharing a poem. Um, because that's the way, I, that, that's my game, as it were. <laughs> lips like yours never, lips like yours, lips like yours, I can't even remember the poem. <laughs> what is it? Lips like yours ought to be worshipped. <laughs> See, I ain't never been too religious, but you can baptize me anytime. 
And then the third thing that happened was Nikki Giovanni became a professor at Virginia Tech. And so that was sort of my way of coming back and finding poetry. Yeah. Wanted to ask you, like, when you were in her class, what kinds of things did she do to draw you out as a poet? Did she have exercises? Did she do you do some of the same things now with the students that you have, or, or what? Yeah, you know, I, I like to use sort of the analogy that my parents um, sort of showed me the dance of words. They showed me the dance of words. My father, obviously a writer, an educator, my mother an educator, a storyteller, um, a writer. And I, I, they showed me the dance of words. When I got to Virginia Tech, I think that Nikki Giovanni sh sort, of, sort of helped me find my own groove, sort of sh taught me the dance. But she taught, me it, it, she taught me the dance in a really sort of different way than you would expect an advanced poetry class on a college <laughs> campus. Um, Greg and Priya, the teachers here in the nines and tens, they've been asking me for six months, Kwame, please send us your program outline for the writer in residency. We want to see your curriculum. What are you going to do? And of course, my thing is, well, we'll find out when I get there. <laughs> and that's how I was taught. You didn't know what was going to happen each day in the class. But what you did know is that you were going to learn how to dance naked on the floor. You were going to learn how to take that risk, how to take that creative leap. And when you came out sort of on the other side, when you leapt off of that cliff, you were going to have a better, a clearer understanding of how to make words dance on the page, of how to make poetry behave. And the way she got there was unconventional, but it was, it was miraculous. It was, it, was, it was incredible. I mean, she made words come off the page. And so yes, we sat in a circle, and we read poems, and we workshop poems, and as you, if many of you have heard or, or seen Nikki on television or YouTube, she does not hold her tongue. She lets you know. And if the poem sucked, the poem sucked. She's gonna say it sucked, you know? It's uninteresting. And you're gonna leave with a, with a really bruised ego and you're gonna wanna figure out how to make it better. Um, it, was, it was tense. It got heated in her class. She allowed for space for people to, 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 to discuss and argue and people got up and walked out of class. I got up and walked out a couple times. Um, we, it was literary sparring. And, uh, and then of course, after that first semester of taking her class, I went back and signed up for the next class. <laughs> and I did it for three years straight. And, uh, and it was the, the best decision I ever made in terms of writing. Oh. Was there a moment or a poem that you wrote that was sort of a breakthrough where you felt, oh, now I kind of really have a hang of this? With her? Yeah. Or, or at another time? Is there a poem that I felt like I had a breakthrough? Um, well, I think as it relates to uh, one of the, so in, my, in the garage, we all know what the garage is there, right? <laughs> there were first editions of these books called, I want to say it's called the First Poet Series. And these were a series of broadsides, or, or, or a saddle stitch <laughs> booklets, five by eight, published by Third World Press, a poet by the name of Haki Matabuti. And he published all these amazing poets, Sonia Sanchez, Amiri Baraka, um, Carolyn Rogers, and Sam Greenlee, the guy who wrote Spook Who Sat By The Door. He, just, he published all these different books, and one of the books had this amazing poem in it. And it was a poem by, um, by Jackie Early. It's called 1,968 Winters. I got up this morning feeling good and black. Thinking black thoughts, I did black things like played all my black records and minded my own black business. I put on my best black clothes, walked out my black dough, and Lord have mercy, white snow. <laughs> and so I'm in the garage supposed to be cleaning, and I'm reading these poems and laughing. And then, you know, nine years old, reading these poems that were published, you know, in the '60s, and, and just enjoying myself. And so I went to, um, I went to a school. I did a school visit, one of my first school visits and had to figure out how to connect with these kids who were uninterested in poetry. And I read that poem, and it just it resonated. The kids woke up and they listened. And so I, I knew that I wanted to write a poem like that. And so there was a poem I wrote in a book called Crush. And it's a poem about a boy and a girl and, 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 and what happens on their, an experience that happens to them. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a poem that has two words on each line. 
um, to two, two, two words on each line, and it sort of crescendos, it builds. And I end up writing sort of the, the, the seminal or the pivotal poem in the crossover, just like that poem. But that's sort of the poem that, uh, it's called In My Closet on the Top Shelf is a Silver Box. That's the poem where I said, oh, I think I figured out sort of how Kwame's gonna dance naked on the floor as a poet, what my style, what my swag is. Yeah. Dr. Um, Alexander, you've been so involved in history as a historian, a researcher, both in your, fam your own family history, but also the whole history of um, African American people. Um, I'm curious about who your heroes are, who the people, historical figures, you feel most inspired by. Well, in terms of, we'll keep it real here in terms of the environment at, at Bank Street. When, when we talk about Harlem Institute for Teachers or the HIT program, I was already familiar with the Harlem community coming from rural Virginia. I had no idea what I was in store for. And one of the uh, heroes who died recently, Dr. Yosef Ben Yekinen, and I went on to uh, work with him for over 25 years, Dr. John G. Jackson, uh, Dr. John Henry Clark. I went to his house for 13 months interviewing him for a biography. But, but the, 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 the ironic thing about it was Bank Street had a, a, a satellite in Harlem called Bank Street in Harlem. So one of the things that uh, we were a part of, and I, I, I'll digress and go back to an additional course that we developed. Many was integral to this, Yvonne Chisholm, Betty Machuca, and Sheila, uh, Sheila Davis, all members of, of, of the program here at Bank Street. And things that's kind of developed. I don't know how many years the social studies program was developed here. So one of the things that we were able to leave with Bank Street was not only to not complain only about what was not existing, but Bank Street was amenable to uh, opening up and broadening their uh, perspectives on teacher education. And we feel very good about that, and, and we take pride in the fact that we were able to be a part of that. Now, in terms of my own research and relations, one of the things that we learned here was how to practice what we preach. We first saw young people as human beings. That's why uh, one of the reasons Kwame can go to Brazil and uh, wow them. He can go to Rome and wow them, W-O-W. <laughs> <laughs> and he can go to Long Island where we can't even get a job driving the cab because we don't speak a foreign language or a car service. He can go in the classroom. He went to Albany about eight years ago. They've been calling him back to the places in Long Island to work with children. So Bank Street taught us about the common humanity. And Minnie and I and the others that I've named, and the reason I'm calling Minnie's name here because she was like, she thought she was growner than the rest of us. So, but we would say crazy things and do crazy things. And Minnie was, would always bring us down to earth. So she had that kind of influence. She was trying to act like Miss Carter before we got to Miss Carter, before the word got to her. Miss Carter, you need to do something about these people, and uh, this whole thing about Miss Carter was supposed to be, for lack of a better term, disciplining us, disciplining us, uh, 
me in particular, and some others. <laughs> and she would dramatize it so like you felt like you were an integral part of your own uh, reconstruction in terms of your behavior. <laughs> so you, you can't teach that in school. So, so we connect with what we have in common. We have a common humanity. Secondly, all children are learners. As a teacher to be, now keep in mind, uh, I wasn't in any way, form or fashion, shape, form or fashion. No one would have, ever have accused me of being a teacher. I was a teacher in the making. And she helped facilitate that. So we learned to see children as learners, to see each other as learners. So one of the reasons we were able to come to Bank Street, a 45 semester hour degree program, and we left here with 55. Well, we did it not because we were smart, we did it because it was part of a neat national teacher corps program and we didn't have to pay tuition. When I got to teacher's college, it was $90 of credit. <laughs> and you young people think, that's cheap. Yeah, it was cheap 46 years ago. <laughs> So I'm talking way back then, as y'all would call it. We would call it, and I would call it yesterday. <laughs> and so when, when, when you look at that, Kwame is a sixth generation Afro-Union Civil War soldier, seven in fact, who fought to save the United States of America and to defeat slavery. And this year is the what anniversary that all America should be celebrated. Anybody? What year is this other than 2015 in relations to the growth and development of the United States of America? Anybody want to make an A? <laughs> Somebody has to know. Oh, now you kind of late. That was a little early. That was 1863. This would be the 152nd year. 150th anniversary of Lincoln's assassination. Think about it. This is the sesquicentennial anniversary of the end of the American Civil War. The year reunification began. The year that black folk made strides after volunteering to fight. So wherever Kwame goes with his training, he's not limited to poetry because he's an educator because his great-grandfather who fought at Shape and Farms, New Market Heights, where 14 of the 37 Congressional Medal of Honor recipients were Afro-Union soldiers. He's just six generations removed from that. So the whole thing about uniting America, common causes, freedom, common cause now, keeping America progressive as one nation. So the whole idea of what his DNA, what's in his DNA, began six generations ago, six generations uh, ago. Let me, let me say, let me say this, sorry to interrupt you, but Go let ahead. me say no this. Problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, to answer your question, <laughs> my father's heroes, and to a certain degree, mine, as I'm working on, um, sort of formulating in my mind a new book project, are the Afro-Union um, Civil War soldiers. I saw it coming. He's devoted, yeah. he's devoted the last 15, 20 years of his life to research of, uh, in particular, my great-great-grandfather, March Corporal, um, who was in the 2nd USCT Regiment. Um, but in general, um, all of the Afro-Union Civil War soldiers. So I would posit to say that those are his heroes. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if anybody in the audience here has a question <laughs> for anybody up here. Just raise your hand and speak up. Yes. No, I mean, the, the dad in your book. She said, why was the dad in the book so afraid of hospitals? 
crossover. And the crossover. Did you want to say anything about it? <laughs> uh, you wrote the book. <laughs> I don't want them to know that uh, uh, I was a ghostwriter. <laughs> No way, I'm just talking. <laughs> I would say that in my sort of dealings with some of the men in my life, the uncles or the older men, I've always had this sort of gut feeling that, oh, I'm going to be okay. I don't need to go to the doctor. I don't need to go to the hospital. I'm going to be fine. Oh, it's okay. I'll just put a little vitamin E on it. You know, I mean, I've always got, and I don't know if there's anybody in particular that I could point to, but I would say my feeling has been that that has been a problem with men, more so than it has been with women. That would be my feeling. And so that's where that came from. There was probably an instance, something that happened, but that's where it came from. Yeah, it's a little bit like men not wanting to look at maps when they're traveling. <laughs> but I wondered about that too. Yeah, question. Um, have you ever shared your work with your father before it was published? You want, you want to answer or you want me to answer? I would like you to answer. Can you repeat the question? Oh, the question was, have I ever shared my work with my father before it was published? That's like, uh, when you think about that, that's a good question. <laughs> We've always door for communication. That's another thing, uh, the Bank Street way. <laughs> Communicate, keep, keep doors open. Not only be sympathetic, but be empathetic. Listen, teachers to be, or teachers who are teachers. If you listen to a learner to be uh, a young child in early childhood who is an emerging learner who's trying to learn in and everything, like my grandson here, uh, Makai, my granddaughter, Samaya, they are just brilliant, not because they were endowed uh, to be brilliant. They are brilliant because they come from a, an environment of brilliance. Yeah, see. <laughs> and of, 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 of Kwame, my being familiar with his work. Once you train him, you let him go. And you are so thrilled with their, uh, uh, Output. Now, in terms of, 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 let me give you one example. He came to me about 20 years ago, about prior to one of our numerous trips to London, to the London Book Fair, Black Radical, and Third World Books. And he said, Daddy, I want to publish a book of poetry. So my whole thing was, <laughs> see, I've been selling books since. 1968, between 123rd, my wife and I were students, Kwame was a baby, between 123rd and 122nd Street on Amsterdam Avenue, selling children's books because I was determined that not only was I, was, I that we were going to create an environment of children's books with children that looked like our children. We only had one at a time, but for children and parents and anybody who would buy a book. So, Kwame, I said, poetry, you're not going to make any money. Because all of you know, in New York, everybody's a poet. Everybody got a poem to spend and no material kinds of, 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 of responses to show for it. Make a long story short, I didn't go along with his intention. But if you don't like something, your child has an idea. So we was. We were told here at Bank Street to, to be, be open to creativity, be open-minded, be supportive. I gave him $1,700. He ain't paid it back since. 
and I hope the Newberry Award will kind of help us out. The deal is, I wanted to start. I wanted to start. My father owned a publishing company, a small press, and I wanted to start an imprint. And I just studied with Nikki Giovanni for three years. I had read all the poets. I knew poetry. I thought I did. And so let's start an imprint. I'll run the imprint. I'm 22 years old. You taught me everything I know. Let's start an imprint. He laughed. Poetry's not going to sell. And so my thing was, well, I don't need you. I'm going to start my own company. And he said, OK. And I'm going, I'm, metaphorically, I'm walking out the door. Literally, he hands me a check for $1,700 to invest in my poetry publishing company. And it, it was like cognitive dissonance. I didn't understand. He said, no, but yet you're giving me money. The, the question is, do I show him? I don't sh really show anybody my work before it's published except my awesome agents, uh, Deborah Warren and, uh, and, and Ruben Pfeffer and, and, and some writer friends. But I don't really show it to, to family and, and, and friends. Um, I will say this. This was the first book. This is the 18th book. This is the first book that my mother and father, well, no, not my mother, because my mother has read everything and loved everything and, and, exp and expressed that. This was the first book that my father and I have literally had conversations every day about the book and, and, and his feeling on it, his feelings about it. So that's been very different and, and, and quite awesome. Let me, let me say one thing before the next question. Uh, oops, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make this quick. The, the whole idea, this is for you young parents and not so young parents in terms of the nurturing part of of growing up to, to womanhood or manhood. In 1978, I was director, I was headmaster of Yuhura Sasa Independent African Heritage School in Brooklyn. At the time I was headmaster, the largest, had the largest enrollment of any independent school, black school in the country. And they had a, dem they had a demonstration led by Reverend Herbert Daltrey at the House of Lord Church in Brooklyn. Some of you may have heard of that name. They were marching across the Brooklyn Bridge, so gave them permission to march across the, Br the Brooklyn Bridge to protesting. They fired up and Ed Koch got to go, we ain't taking it no more. And this is 1978. In 1998, he co-edits a book called 360 Degrees 60 Degrees of Revolutionary Poetry, an excellent book, by the way. And I read in this book in 1998, 20 years later, that he had trepidations about marching across the Brooklyn Bridge saying, uh, Koch got to go, we are tired, we ain't taking it no more. I've learned 20 years later. So in terms of your question, just be clear about what your children write about their experiences growing up in, in, uh, as young people. So he thought the Koch was going to have the Brooklyn Bridge to open and everybody would go down and drown. <laughs> but I, I learned about this 20 years later in that book. So the whole idea Allow the young people under your tutelage, not only as a parent, but as an early childhood teacher. You know, let them grow, let them flow, let, it, let them soar. It doesn't have to conform to your lesson plans. The idea is to learn the rudiments of whatever discipline, of whatever topic you're trying to teach. Don't restrict how they learn, provide an opportunity for them to learn. And uh, that's the plug for the Bank Street Way 46 years. <laughs> All right. Uh, maybe, uh, Jenny, we have time for one or two more questions? Maybe one more. One more. Okay, right there. Me? Okay. Yes. Um, I guess this is more a question for Kwame, but um, as I was reading Crossover, like I know nothing about basketball, so it felt more than just like the idea of basketball as a game. It felt like stronger, like a form of a metaphor. And I was wondering what inspired you to use basketball in that way in your book.
that too deep of a question? No, it's good. It's good. This is our last question? Yeah. All right. So, I was away at college, and I came back home sophomore year, and I'm in the attic because I like to meddle. My grandmother said, why is he upstairs in my room? That boy is always meddling. My father's mother. I like to go in her drawers and look under her dressers. I was always that kid who liked to meddle. And so I'm in the attic, in the garage, and I'm just looking around. And I find, a couple things I find. One is an old scrapbook. which I had seen numerous times in different places in the house, in, in our different homes, because we lived in North Carolina, New York, Virginia. And this was a scrapbook of my dad playing basketball. He played in, co in high school, college, and the Air Force. Right? Right. And he was fairly good. I mean, there, his that picture... was good. Right. <laughs> it was good. Yeah, yeah. So he was great. Like, the pictures... He was on the cover of the newspapers, and, and he's, all the pictures are like action, and he's moving, and it's just, he's the man, right? And, and, so, and, so, and so I loved reading those articles because he didn't talk about it too much. You know, my dad, when I came around, my dad was the Bank Street Teachers College intellectual. So the whole, the cool part of my dad had sort of gone on sabbatical, at least in my perspective. I mean, it, it hadn't, but at least in my perspective, he was no longer, but I saw this scrapbook, and I'm looking, and I see these, the big, his nickname was the Big Al, and so I look at another crate, and I see these jazz records. Now, in my house, we listened to gospel music, if we did listen to music, and sometimes my sisters and I would listen to Michael Jackson or what have you, but jazz was not something that I remember ever listening to, so I'm looking at these albums, and there are all these jazz records. Duke Ellington, Ella Live in Berlin, Ornette Coleman, Miles Davis Sketches in Spain. I'm like, wow, who's, whose records are these? And of course, at the top of the record, it says Property of the Big Al. Like, what? He was a basketball player? He was a jazz lover? This guy was cool. <laughs> when I sat down to write the crossover, those two things became inspirations for me. Um, yeah, I wanted to hook... You know, we often hear, and Pam, Pam Allen up there, she's, she's a part of this organization that she st started called Books for Boys. We often hear about boys don't read. We don't have enough good books for boys, or how do we get boys to read? It's just like this epidemic. And so I've often believed, you know, I, was, I remember being given this book about Muhammad Ali called The Greatest, edited by Toni Morrison when she was at Random House. It was a book that I could not put down. It was the first like 400 page book that I read as a kid. Basketball was a way I figured, hey, let me just use this. This is going to be a hook. But wait a minute, it's going to be more than a hook. What did it do for me? Basketball and jazz were these ways that I became, I came to really sort of love my father in a whole other kind of way. If you listen to jazz music, and if you've got sort of this rhythm on the court, then you're a lover of love. And I can appreciate that. And that's something that I fell in love with. And I wanted to try to put that into that book, that spirit into that book. So yeah, it became, it became a hook and it became a metaphor. <laughs> all so much for a fabulous and scintillating conversation about Bank Street, education, poetry, jazz, and I hope you will allow our guests to move up into the lobby for their autographing and then go out and enjoy some food and refreshment and get a book signed. Thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate it.